start our morning with H716, which is the bill um, that would give uh, permanent um, lifetime uh, fishing and hunting licenses um, to uh, members of the Native American tribes. And um, I don't know whether we'll be able to finish with that this morning, but Ellen has come back with a redraft based on what we did yesterday. And um, we are also uh, assuming that we have time and I think we will uh, spend some time on education finance. Scott has done some work on a, uh, an idea on how to, um, I guess the way it characterizes how to bridge um, sort of some of the questions that we have about 21. Um, and um, he's gonna talk about that. Um, and the other piece of business I wanted to take care of was the Hartford TIF. Yesterday we voted the bill. Um, I neglected to ask anybody to report it. Um, and so I asked Peter Anthony if he would do that and he said he would. So he's gonna report that bill out. And uh, Peter, I wonder if you could uh, make sure that uh, Representative Christie knows that it's coming out um, and sort of what the timing is, but to go out today. Um, Happy to do that. Great, thank you. Uh, so uh, unless someone on the committee has an announcement or a question um, before we get started, I, and I don't see any hands, so I think I'll ask Alan to walk us through the redraft that was based on yesterday's discussion of H716. And Lewis Porter is here with us um, if we have questions for the department. All right, good morning. My name is Ellen Tchaikowski. I'm with the Office of Legislative Counsel. And as the chair just said, I'm here on H716, an act relating to Abenaki hunting and fishing licenses. You all discussed this bill yesterday and I have drafted an amendment to it based on the conversation you had. It is posted on the website and it is now on the screen. So the changes that I made are in yellow. Um, and you did also pose some questions that you wanted me to look into so I can talk about those as well. So, so first, in, in drafting this bill, um, you can see that it starts with section 4455, which is the license fee section. Um, and there are a number of other permanent or free licenses in this section. So I added this language here so that we didn't have to build any additional or new uh, structure for creating this, for creating a new license. What we're doing is we're really just saying that this group of people can have a free uh, permanent license. So in having a license, you have to follow the requirements. And so, so one of the questions you did have yesterday was whether or not there would the, members would need to uh, comply with the hunter safety course requirement. So the requirements for holding a hunting license are more generally are in another section. Uh, I do think they would apply to this section, but I do think it could have been a little more clear. So I did add the language um, that's in yellow, and I think it makes it a little more clear. So Section 7A now reads, a certified citizen of a state recognized Native American Indian tribe may receive a free permanent fishing license, or if the person qualifies for a hunting license, a free permanent combination hunting and fishing license. And that references the qualifications for a hunting license, which does require a hunter safety course or previous proof of such a course or uh, proof of holding a license. Um, uh, questions anyone has? I think I understand it. I've looked at it twice now, so it took me a minute. But um, so it has this word qualify is what matters. Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. Um, there aren't any such uh, qualifications for fishing licenses. That's why they're sort of teased out. Um, so if a person doesn't uh, do the hunter safety course, they can have a free fishing license. But if they do the qualification, they can. Um, get the combination license. So then, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Pat oh, has a question. Oh, sure. 
Uh, thank you. Going back to um, line 13, section 7A, what does yeah. it mean by a certified citizen of a state rec recognized Native American Indian tribe? Does that, does that mean any Native American Indian tribe in the country? No. No, so there are four state recognized Native American Indian tribes in Vermont. Um, those are listed and established in Title I, Chapter 23. So uh, I tried to mirror that language exactly. Um, and so no, it's just limited to the Vermont state recognized tribes. Okay, but the way I, oh, you, I'm not going to question you, but uh, I'm, I'm thinking a certified citizen of a state recognized means any state. Would it be helpful to make reference to the definition in Title I? Or is that inferred? I, I'm not sure. Um, I thought it was inferred. Um, if it would help to clarify, we could add Vermont state recognized Native American Indian tribe. That would that might help clarify things. I mean, if somebody from out of state out west were to read that, I would take it to mean that they could come in and get a free uh, permanent fishing license or hunting license. It, just by reading line 13. I'm, that's just me, I guess, but. Uh, well, I think what we meant was Vermont, so. Um, yeah, if we I mean Vermont, maybe yeah. we should say that. Right. Is, is right that okay? we... Alan, does that do, do anything else that we're not aware of? I, I don't think so. I don't normally work <laughs> on the, um, Damien is the attorney in our office that normally handles the, uh, right. the Native American mm -hmm. um, issues, and so I don't yeah. think so. I can I can double check with him. He did look at this and did not uh, see an issue there, so I, I can add Vermont if that would help clarify it. What I think would be, um, because I don't know what it means to say a Vermont, so that's sort of a new concept. I I would just say a state recognized Native American Indian tribe as defined in section blah, 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 of Title I, whatever, whatever it is. Um, that, to me, that is absolutely clear that we're talking about that definition as opposed to introducing a new concept of Vermont state. Sure, um, right, so, so I think chapter that yeah, yeah. Ch chapter one of Title 10 establishes the process by which a, a tribe can be recognized by the state of Vermont. So, oh, and, then it, is... and then it lists the tribes that have been recognized. So I would refer to the list. Okay. I think, that, does, that, does that work for, uh, uh, Jim, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, I think what you said, recognizing the statute the title where recognition recognition occurs is the best way to, to use it here, the best way to define what we're talking about. So, um, I, I, Pat, I appreciate you raising the issue and we don't need to do all the drafting here, but, um, but I think um, if you can, um, if you, if you, if Ellen, if you want to check with Damien, that's fine, um, however you want to do it, but um, it'd probably be good to make it clear. Um, okay. So, okay. So uh, let's see. So back to the bill. Um, so uh, you did also have a discussion about minors yesterday. So in rewriting some of the language about the minors, I pulled it out into its own section just because it was becoming a bit wordy. So the new language I added uh, reads, a minor may receive a permanent free com uh, permanent fishing license, or if the minor qualifies for a hunting license, a free permanent combination hunting and fishing license, 
upon submission of a current and valid tribal identification card or upon written certification from the minor's parent or guardian who is also a certified citizen of a state recognized Native American Indian tribe that the minor is a citizen of a state recognized Native American Indian tribe. So you did have a discussion about this yesterday. So by way of background, I do not know the exact age at which members of the tribe receive their card. And so I added the or, either they can present their card or have written certification from their parent or guardian. Um, so that is a choice that I made. I know that you did ask for the language about parent or guardian who is a certified citizen. Um, I initially drafted this to be as broad as possible to cover um, people um, who are members, who are certified citizens. I don't, I do not know a lot about the tribal members, but I do, I can think of a few situations in which a child would be a member of a tribe, but their parent or guardian would not be a member of the tribe um, if they were living with a family member who was their guardian, or if they were living with, um, or if they had been adopted. I think there are, are other situations in which the child might not be um, living with a person who is a member of the tribe, so that's something to consider. Uh, let me see if there's questions. Emily. Um, I went to that same place around adoption and concerns about that. Um, and I don't want to get too lost in every eventuality, but um, it does seem problematic that the parent or guardian has to be a certified citizen. Um, it might even, you know, I could even see a situation where it was something that was very important to a 15 year old to become a certified citizen. And for whatever reason, it was not important to that person's parent who might, you know, uh, be of a Beneke heritage, but not interested in becoming a citizen. Um, I don't know. Do you have ideas for a workaround there? So my only thought was under current law, um, children 16 and under have to have um, their parent or guardian sign their license anyways. So written certification of some kind um, seems to make sense for minors. Um, my other thought is that section 4267 of Title 10 um, prohibits any false uh, or uh, false statements on an application for a license, those are prohibited as a, as a minor fish and wildlife violation. So if there's concern that someone would sign up their child for a free license who was not actually qualified, um, there, it, that is already prohibited by statute. Uh, Emily, are you done for the moment? Uh, Jim. Yeah, um, my concern yesterday had to do with, I guess, um, Patrick's question about someone wandering in from Oklahoma or something like that and, and um, with a minor in tow or something and, and trying to get a free hunting and, and um, <clears throat> fishing license. And I'm not sure the best way to word it. I think the way Ellen has worded it um, works for me. I don't find it particularly problematic, um, but I'm just trying to um, establish some guardrails so that things don't get out of hand. And um, if there's a if there's a more convenient way to word it that does the same thing, then that's fine by me. Emily. Thanks. I was in a, um, I had a long pause because I wanted to scroll Sorsha's computer and I couldn't, so I was bringing it to my own. <laughs> um, I, I think my concern um, is that 
the requirement that the parent must be a certified citizen is still seems to be the parent or guardian is also a certified citizen um still seems to be in this language and couldn't it just be that the parent or guardian certifies that the youth is eligible to be a certified citizen and that would solve jim's concern but also make allowances for adoption and such Jim, you were the one who had the concern. I, I'm, I'm, um, I think I'm with Emily. I think I would just say that they have to certify and the department will um, have to deal with the question about whether they fit within the definition that we've created here. But, um, but I, I want to be sure your concerns are addressed. Well, um, generally this is all going in a good direction, I think. Um, in, in most tribes, I can't speak for all tribes, but when a, um, when a, when a child is born or adopted into a Native American family that's recognized, um, the um, children are automatically recognized as in my offspring are recognized, for example. So that um, there might be some instance where some, um, a youngster whose parents are blowing off recognition um, goes to the tribe and asks to be recognized um, or included on tribal roles, actually is the way it would be. Um, um, those situations may exist. And if, if, um, if Emily's language accommodates that a little better, that's fine. Um, so uh, Lewis um, has uh, something that might be helpful to us. Thank you. I just wanted to, to point out that from my perspective, there will be virtually no way for us to check this. Um, anybody can go in and, and certify. We don't have access to the roles of the, of the tribes. We don't have authority to even know what the, what the criteria on which membership is based. And we'll have no way to check and see if somebody is actually if somebody's child is actually, uh, uh, you know, actually uh, uh, a member of the tribe, it, it is, of course, you know, against statute to be falsify these. I can tell you, we frequently have people falsify the the, um, the 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 pledge they make that they have passed hunter safety, which is just to save themselves a day of time in a hunter safety class not to save themselves tens of thousands of dollars over a lifetime in in honor ed and uh, license fees so i can i can promise you that there will be a large number of people who certify their children are members of the tribe and we will have uh almost no way to to check that thank you uh lewis is that true with or without the language that emily has put forward here well i think if they're at least presenting a a membership card or at least they are presenting that they are a member of the tribe. That helps because, the, you know, the, 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 it gives us a, at least a little bit of a way to check that they are connected in some way to the tribe. I, I'm, yeah, mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm willing to take the hit and, and remove the, and, and, and frankly, uh, in the end, eliminate um, positions to save the money that it would cost to provide licenses to Abenaki members. I'm not willing to eliminate people's jobs to provide them to people who are not members. And that's what I'm trying to get at here. I'm trying to be clear what you're recommending then. Are, are you saying that the language that Emily's put forward here is better than the bill as it came in and that it at least goes part way to address what you're talking about? Yes, I, I think it's reasonable to ask that people either have a, 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 a membership card for their child or that they are a member of the of the of the band. They, I don't think that there's any age limit on becoming a member or getting a certification card that says you're a member. Um, so if people if people is if if I was the guardian of a member but I am not a member myself, I can get a membership card. I expect for for my child. This is probably throwing a monkey wrench into things, but what if we um, said, if we stopped on line 20 after the word guardian, 
Um, and, oh, I'm sorry, we took out the who is also a certified citizen, but uh, added a sentence saying that the department may require um, the parent to, uh, to uh, show a card or whatever the, the so, that, so that you don't have to, it, it isn't a requirement in every single case, but you can impose it in a case where you think there might be an issue. Right, or, or you could eliminate the entire section dealing with minors and just say you need to present a citizenship card, whatever age you are. Get, get rid of the guardian part and, and eliminate the entire section dealing with minors and just say, you know, you need to present a, a citizenship card. Keep in mind that people don't have to have a fishing license until they're 15, although they do have to have a hunting license if they're going to hunt alone. Uh, Emily, but they can't hunt when they're two years old, right? You have to be a certain age. <laughs> we, we don't have any age limit on hunting. You have yeah. to be able to pass hunter safety be able to pass and, and not have the instructor turn you down. Right. Yeah. Uh, Emily. and um, Lewis, I appreciate what you said. I don't really know anything about any of this. And so what <laughs> I want to understand here is, um, are you saying that someone can become a certified citizen of a state recognized Native American Indian tribe at any point in their life. Sure. They can do that if they're 12 or nine or whatever, they can, that's available for all four recognized tribes. You know, I, I, I hesitate to speak because I, on this, because I'm not, I, I don't have a, a role in that and I don't know the processes for each of the bands. I, I would be surprised if there was a limit, an age limitation on becoming a member of the band, but I encourage you to reach out to the Commission on Native American Affairs for an answer on that. Because if that's true, then getting rid of all of this certification stuff would be great. Which is why I suggested. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but I would want to make sure that was true first. Yes. Understood. And this has gotten much too complicated. <laughs> it'll, it'll, um, we'll figure it out. Um, okay, uh, Jim. Yeah, I think Lewis is correct. And I think that um, to um, explain a little bit about becoming a citizen, if one is on the tribal roles of such and such a band, that person is a citizen. And that's basically by virtue of, of birth and, and genealogy, occasionally by adoption. But um, for instance, shortly after birth, an infant child of Native American tribe um, can be entered into the roles and that person is then a citizen regardless of age. And that can happen late in life too if someone finds out that um, sure enough, they can establish clear Native American lineage part of the tribe tracing to the tribe's members, then okay, fine, that person is entered onto the tri tribal, tribal roles and then as a citizen of the tribe. So the recommendation that is on the table at the moment is to remove B entirely. Is that what I'm understanding? And yeah, right. um, that requires that there be some, some communication uh, just to confirm um, uh, that you can become a citizen at, at any age so that we're not uh, excluding. I mean, obviously you have to be able to pass the hunter safety course and I suppose right. hold a fishing Good. rod. Right. Um, okay, uh, Peter. Uh, if we um, lose the entire section, as I recall, unless it's elsewhere and I've forgotten it, uh, uh, Director Porter did say that upon request, at least uh, a membership card or some form of certification would be um, language uh, allowing the um, warden to request that or the issuer of a license to request that would be helpful. It does say, we're, we're not taking out A, we're just taking out B. Okay. I think that's right. I, I wasn't hearing where we're gonna move, remove A. Okay, that does it then, thanks. Yeah. Am, I, am I right, everybody? Nobody's answering me. That's what I heard. And that language is in A. Thank you. It just reminds me of when my kids were four and six and I used to talk and nobody answered. So, okay. Uh, why don't you um, continue through? 
Sure, I'll, I have one other thing I wanted to add um, broadly. So there was a question yesterday about whether or not um, general enforcement would, provisions would apply to holders of these licenses. And the answer is yes. Um, the way that Title 10 is framed is that it discusses wildlife violations uh, and enforcement uh, regardless if someone is holding a license. And so uh, this isn't creating a new class or type of license where people don't have to uh, follow the law. This is just uh, giving a free license and that comes with the responsibility of following the law. So there, there isn't anything um, different about this license other than that it is free. And the way, the way you've structured 7A, I think makes that even more clear. So um, yeah. I appreciate that. So the other two changes um, in the bill. Yep, so then uh, in section two, uh, the commissioner requested that we push out the reporting date um, until uh, two additional years so that there were three years covered by this. So uh, section two requires that the commissioner report back January 15th, 2024 about how many licenses have been issued um, pursuant to this section. And then I also changed the effective date in section three to January 1, 2021. Okay. Um, so uh, questions from the committee. Um, so the, the, where I'm understanding this at the moment is that um, we're going to consider uh, removing B, 7B, so there would just be a 7, no A, no, no we don't need a letter there. Um, and, <clears throat> excuse me, we're going to, um, uh, Ellen's gonna, uh, confirm that referring to the list in Title I is the best way to make sure that we're, we've defined this. We, uh, this is gonna apply the way we think it's going to. Um, and um, with respect to B, I guess I'm gonna ask um, uh, Emily, I wonder if you would be willing to pursue the question about whether this is, um, gonna work, gonna work the way we think it's going to. Mm -hmm. um, and if we need to hear from somebody, if you could let Sorsha and me know who it is that we need to hear from, mm -hmm. if it's just a matter of talking to somebody and confirming, um, I'm okay with that, but if committee members wanna actually have a witness, then we'll do that as well. Um, and so what I'd like to do is um, at least get a, show of hands on um, on what we have at this point. Um, and we can't vote it until we've checked out those two things and so, um, and have a final draft in front of us. So Sam. I was, I was just gonna say, I liked the idea, if it works, obviously, of you should have a card in order to get the license. I don't know if that works in all instances, but that would be the cleanest in my mind. Yeah. Pat. Uh, I. I've been sitting here thinking about my main concern about uh, loss of revenue, and I had a brainstorm, which may or may not be very well accepted. Um, you know, we've for years, it, uh, our fishing accesses and boat ramps and boat launches and stuff have been um, available to everyone, whether they pay registration or use fees uh, or not. And if your boat is registered, if you have a hunting or fishing license, you are able to use those facilities and you do pay a user fee. Um, but non-motorized vehicles um, is where I'm headed, do not and have not and, and enjoy the use of those um, facilities um, to this day. And I think I, I might offer an amendment to um, recapture some of the lost revenue uh, that would include uh, an access user fee to all um, watercraft. You know, it would have to be crafted. Uh, I think there's a, a bill in the Senate, as a matter of fact, that does just that. Um, and it may fill the void created by um, this bill. 
uh, maybe maybe essentially leveling um, things off as far as loss of revenue. Um, but it's, it, it was it's a quick thought and um, it may need some uh, fine tuning, but I'd like to throw that out there. And I don't know how fast we're moving on this bill, but if it's gonna be voted on today, I, I may have to do a, a floor amendment, but I'd like to anyway, put something together. Uh, Scott and then Robin. Um, I just, my two cents, um, I'd like the direction of the conversation this morning of um, turning this into a two-step process, citizenship, and then application for for a um, license. I think that's a, a good direction. Um, I'm also, you know, sensitive to uh, Fish and Game taking a, a revenue hit on this, and um, I'm not sure if, uh, if a new fee is the answer or the uh, modification, uh, changing at some an existing fee, but um, you know, we, we're, this is a, you know, it's a, maybe a well thought out um, to, um, for the Abenaki and other tribes to right the wrongs, but um, of the past, but it's still a, still a revenue hit for fish and game. And I think that we should, we should talk about that. Uh, Robin. Thank you. Um, I also like I like where this bill is going, and uh, and I understand it's about the revenue hit. And, um, somebody who canoes in the Otter Creek, I would be willing to pay to register my canoe. Um, uh, but I'm wondering, uh, Pat, if um, if you look at H581, which is up for second reading today, which is the funding of the Department of Fish and Wildlife, if you're going to put an amendment somewhere seems to me that that would be the more appropriate place to put an amendment. I have not read the bill, so I can't claim to yeah. know it, but the title sounds good for what you're talking about. I'm looking at it right now to see yeah. if I can find anything that's close to what's in there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Jim, and oh, I'm sorry, Ellen, yeah, you having to raise your hand because you don't have a blue hand. Go ahead. Um, I just wanted to add something quickly that was not discussed yesterday. Um, so the license does not include any of the tags that a person must purchase for big game or birds. In addition, they will need a second archery license if they wanna take a second deer. So um, if a person is hunting, they will need to purchase the add-ons. Um, so that's just another piece of information. Um, I had Jim and then Peter. Um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, I wouldn't object, have a problem with um, some sort of registering for canoes and kayaks and stuff like that, although I think it would drive the general population out there crazy, even though it's fair. Um, if we do that, we're likely also to see an amendment by somebody that we should register bicycles because we hear about what a pain in the neck they are on the roads. At least that's an opinion. Uh, and if those things were to hit the floor, I'd prefer them to see, I would prefer to see them in another bill rather than um, messing up um, this bill about Native American fishing licenses and hunting licenses because I think. Um, the broader discussion about registering freebies, free riders, um, would um, likely spend a, um, take us a long time on the floor and get us nowhere. And um, so anyway, that's my 10 cents on this. Thank you. Peter. Uh, yes, I'm with Jim. I really would not like to make what potentially is controversial even more so, and I'd rather have it clean. I do agree with Pat that this is increasingly a problem for fish and, and uh, wildlife. Uh, I, I am delighted that Ellen reminded me that if we're going to right a wrong as a moral issue, uh, we really ought not to only do a small job uh, at just the license fee, but the other add-ons. And I'm sorry, being not a regular person, I did not in that area, I, I just didn't think of that and I would be eager to hear from Commissioner Porter. I'm surprised that the uh, Committee of Origin and Representative Lefebvre did, didn't say anything about the add-ons. Um, 
But anyway, I'd rather have this bill be focused simply on Native Americans' right to hunt and fish, as is historically uh, our moral promise. Um, so I can respond slightly to that. Um, so the Natural Resources Committee did discuss that and part of the discussion, and I'm, I'm not a fiscal analyst, but part of the discussion would, was that that would potentially recoup some of the losses um, in revenue if they were having to pay some of these add-on fees. Um, there would be potentially new people joining the hunting sport. And so those people would be paying these additional fees. It would be significantly less than the cost of the license, but it would be some revenue. Um, so I, I don't know, uh, you know, I, I'm not an analyst, but that was a conversation that they thought was a fair balance. So they did look at it and they made a decision to leave it as it is. And I have to admit, I'm sort of inclined to do that as well. Um, the, um, the, the, issue about lost revenue for fish and wildlife that they, they the, the reason why 581 is on the floor even though it hasn't it's kind of stalled out because of the uh, stopping of the calendar um, is because fish we know that fish and wildlife has revenue issues that are much much broader than anything that this bill is creating and um, I have to say I would have a real problem uh, loading this particular bill down with a solution to a much bigger problem that I think it's really a, does a disservice to the uh, people that we're actually trying to assist here. Um, that doesn't mean we won't entertain a, uh, an amendment in the committee, Pat. Um, as a member of the committee, you have, will have an opportunity to do that, but, um, but I, I would be strongly opposed to, to doing that. Um, the, um, and for what it's worth, I'm not real wild about a registration fee on kayaks and canoes, but, um, but that's a whole different, whole different big discussion that we will undoubtedly have at some point. Um, I've got two more people, Peter and Scott. No, Scott, you go ahead. I think I'm inclined to agree with Jim on the uh, keeping the the revenue offset idea, whatever that idea might be, out of out of this bill and, and somewhere else. I think that does make some sense. The other thing I just throw out there to to Pat, um, as far as a revenue source, um, maybe there is some sentiment out there that could be captured um, regarding uh, license plate fees. Um, I'm not very familiar with those fees or the process or what they all are, but I think um, I think Pat probably is, and that might be a, a place to capture that sentiment and and monetize it. Um, are you talking about in a different vehicle, though? Yes. Know. Yeah, I think so. Yep, a different vehicle. Yep. yep. Uh, Jim, and then I'm going to move on because what we what, what the um, I want to set some things in motion, but um, I don't know that we're moving towards voting at this, in, at this point in the discussion. So, um, so uh, we'll get a question from Jim and then um, I'll sort of uh, summarize where we are and, um, and then we'll move on to education finance. So Jim. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I guess it was Scott. Scott, I have a bill, I can say upstairs, I think it's in transportation on establishing a bicycle license plate like a you know well child what um i can't remember the terminology but we know um that would have a small fee that would go to bicycle safety and stuff like that there at least uh, what i'm saying is there's a vehicle out there that hasn't gone anywhere that looks at um bicycle revenues and that sort of stuff like that but it wouldn't be a required fee for everybody with a bicycle it was just a way to put a bicycle on your license plates and raise some money that might help right. someone someday. That's all. And, th and that's what I was kind of thinking of. There might be a, a, a similar sentiment that could be captured um, that would maybe support this type of thing. So um, let me summarize where I think we are. Um, uh, 
with respect to the draft itself, um, we're going, uh, Ellen's gonna look at the definition of who we're talking about, the, whether we refer to Title I or how we do that. Um, Emily is gonna do some work on the, um, who, who is eligible to get a card and whether eliminating that 7B language is gonna work. Um, Pat, if you would let me know if you are going to offer an amendment, um, I can schedule the time for you to do that. Um, and you don't need to let me know the second, just let me know by the end of the day today. I'd appreciate it. Um, and, um, and then we will take this up tomorrow um, with whatever amendment is out there um, and hopefully be able to vote it tomorrow. Uh, Pat, go ahead. Well, I, I, I see this, the, that there is, um, I sense that there is support in the committee for replacing revenue and um, maybe other than the chair uh, on kayaks and, and non-motorized vehicles. I, I, I sense a, a willingness to move forward, but not in this bill. Um, so I won't offer an amendment um, to stick it in this bill. Um, What'd you say the number of the uh, Fish and Wildlife Bill is 581? Yes. yes, 581. And I've looked at it. It's a, it's a, it's largely aspirational, but it sets up a work yeah. group to um, uh, begin to work at these issues. And it might be a great place to put some, actually some specifics about what we think the this work group ought to look at, um, because there's not a lot of guidance in it. Um, it's long, um, but mostly findings and so on. So yeah, definitely. Um, so yeah, I'll hold off on, uh, yeah. on loading up this bill in the committee. I, I sense that I wouldn't go anywhere, but I do sense uh, the committee members are concerned and I look forward to your support on the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we'll schedule this for tomorrow. Uh, did I get the plan right? Did I miss anything? I don't think so, but maybe. Okay, good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lewis, uh, for being available as well. Um, maybe he left. No, he's still there. Okay. Um, thank you. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so um, we are on education finance. Um, at, oh, just before we uh, shift to that, I um, we're scheduled to meet at 10 tomorrow. Um, I hadn't scheduled anything. I assumed we might continue to work on education finance, but we also have two uh, local option bills, H943 and H946 that just came into the committee. I think they both came in. Um, so it, it may be that we end up scheduling those. I have a 10 o'clock meeting, which will go until about 11. So the committee won't start till 11. So we'll have at most an hour tomorrow, um, 11 to 12. Um, I just wanted to make sure people had that before we started signing off. Uh, Mark, are you here? Yes, good morning. Hi, Hi. <laughs> how are you? So do you have something to start us off with? Um, I, I don't, I, I was under the impression that Abby was gonna walk you through the bill. Um, Abby, but, um, I wasn't sure it's that, I couldn't remember whether you, you had prepared something or not, but totally fine. Um, and Abby's here and um, so Scott has been working with Abby on a draft that would be, um, it, it would be focused on the yields and the tax rates. Um, I, I'm not positive what, I can't remember whether the draft actually has them in there. I think we ended up not putting them in, but, um, but the, the framework is there. But what Scott's been working on is more important for the framework than it is for the content at this point. So I'm gonna, uh, Scott, you tell me how you wanna proceed in getting this in front of the committee. Um, I could probably just, if somebody can throw it up on the screen, I can just just walk through it. It's just three sections, two pages. Okay, okay. that's fine. I'll try to try to keep it simple and just explain the idea and then we can have a conversation. And then if, if Abby wants to weigh in on how it structures sure. any thoughts, she can do right. that. Okay. Yep. Or, or anybody else. Yep. Um, so basically, um, there's uh, three sections to this bill. The first section 
in uh, subsections A and B, um, it, it leaves a place for us to put in the, the, the dollar equivalent yields for the income and the property. Um, there's been a lot of conversation about whether that should be the, um, the numbers that were available prior to uh, voting day. Uh, in subsection C, it sets the, um, the non-homestead rate at a buck 62.8, and that's that calculated rate that, that voters had prior to when most voted there at town meeting day. Um, and then in uh, section two, um, if you turn to uh, most of the work there is in, um, in B and C, subsections B and C, and it basically um, just gives the, um, the authority to draw the education fund reserve down to maybe drawn down to 2% in 21. So it's not a will or shall, it's a may. Um, and then uh, in subsection C, it lays out a plan for re, um, repayment of any deficit that is occurred, incurred. Um, right now, if we set those rates at somewhere where they were around town meeting day and we draw the reserves down to 2%, there is still going to be a deficit. And it directs that the, uh, the deficit will be repaid first by avail available federal funding and second by some percent um, of the remaining reversions and, and surplus in the education fund at the close of the fiscal year. So uh, deficit repaid by reversions and um, surplus. Okay. And then in, uh, and then in section three, it basically just says that the, uh, the tax letter that comes out every year on December 1st has to reflect um, this work, which means that they would not be able to uh, count any reversions or surplus towards um, the tax rate, those would all be pulled out before and they would be um, they would be part of the uh, payment. We did this actually for the surplus in session law last year, I believe. So that's not um, something we haven't done before. And that's, that's basically, um, in a nutshell, we set the yields, we let the, um, we let the reserve float down to 2%. That will cause a deficit. Uh, the deficit preferably would be refilled by um, federal funds. If we don't have the federal funds to fill it, then it would be repaid over time by the reversions and the surplus that the education fund may generate on an annual basis. And that's basically it. Okay, uh, questions, anyone has, George. Hi Scott, <clears throat> thanks for the proposal. Does, does this in any way limit our ability to use the federal money, should guidance change or should there be new money for, does it limit us to use no. it other than the deficit? No, it actually, it, 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 it specifically states that if that money does become available, whether it's uh, a um, relaxing of CARES 3 or some subsequent bill that, um, that if those dollars do become available, they would be the first dollars used to address the deficit. I'm sorry, you said it specifically says that? Well, yes. beyond the deficit. Right. Yeah, it specifically says that in uh, section two, subsection C. Minus, that on, minus only C. applies to the deficit. Um, right, right. Yeah, we're only talking about the deficit here. Yeah. So does it, but does it limit our ability to use it elsewhere? I don't think so. Okay. Oops, I lost my. Just but Abby, but Abby might have some thoughts on that, or, or Mark as well. Yeah. Um, so, do Abby or Mark have any thoughts about it? Sure. Um, I don't think that this limits what you can use the funding for. It just says that the first source, if there is any available federal funding, shall be that funding, and then you would use the surplus or reversions. I don't think it. It says. Um, that if federal funding is available, it can only be used for this purpose. Um, Mark, go ahead. You know, we, we've talked about a couple couple of different options for using that CRF money. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if it does preclude the option of uh, appropriating the money to the agency of education and have districts apply to it. That was one of the uses of the CRF. Would, would this preclude sending the money to AOE rather than having it appropriated to the education fund? Hmm. 
I don't know. I, I'm not that sure. should maybe be clarified. Yeah, it's maybe just to, it, this, that isn't really yes. contemplated the way this is drafted. So. And, but part, part of the problem now is I, I'm not clear. On, I, I know the committee's clear on wanting to use that CRF money to address this problem. Right. And I'm just not sure if, if one of the options, one of the options is just would be great, just to put it right in the Ed Fund and that would this bill would follow along with those lines. The other option is to appropriate the money outside of the education fund to the agency of education and have them dole the money out to school districts. So I'm just wondering if this gets in the way of that option. And I'm not I'm not sure it does, but yeah, I'm I'm not sure, but I think if because it's any available federal funding right now, that funding wouldn't be available to be used this way. So if it became available to be used that way, it might preclude another option. So that's probably something that should be clarified. I can try and think of a way to reach that. Yeah. That's a good point. Uh, other questions? Uh, Robin. Thank you. I'm, I'm wondering about the, um, and thanks for doing this, Scott. Um, the, uh, the second option about repaying the deficit by reversions and surplus. Yeah. Um, since there won't be any when we're going into it, I don't, you know, do we have a, how long is that? Do you anticipate that would be taking? Do we have any sort of timeline? I mean, could this be going on for 20 years? Is there a, an interest cost to, you know, if we're borrowing, are we borrowing from the treasury? I mean, I'm not sure how that part of it works. If we're in deficit, well, where's the money yeah. coming from? Well, we, we can have, we can have reversions, but not have a surplus. And that will likely, you know, that is a likely um, occurrence um, in FY21. Um, but yes, I mean, there is certainly a, um, a further um, conversation here, um, you know, when the deficit, if the deficit, if there is a deficit, if federal funding cannot um, close the entire deficit, then there's going to be a further conversation about, um, you know, what is, you know, I think ultimately the treasurer will have to borrow and what, what will be her terms, um, you know, for length and interest and things of that nature. I think that's definitely a, a, a further conversation. Yeah, because I'm wondering if we could um, use the same theory that we're using with allowing the short term municipal borrowing where that maybe some of the CARES money could be used to buy down any interest that it would cost us to do this. I don't know, I may be getting too far out here, but I am yeah. concerned about that. I'm concerned about it not being federal funds and it getting much more expensive and complicated for us and the Ed Fund. Right. I mean, it, you know, it, it would be a deficit. And unless we can find dollars outside of the education fund to to retire it or pay off some of it, then that automatically, you know, falls to the education fund and it falls to property taxpayers. Um, it will it will be um, a discussion over how many years that that repayment would be necessary. Right. And it might expand, extend beyond the next fiscal year. Oh, as well, well right? I mean, right. a deficit, yeah. uh, we may have deficits in future ed years if we were to continue because we're going to yeah. have lower property taxes and right. We don't, we don't know in the end what the deficit number will be right now as we sit here, right? Um, today, um, depending on what that number ends up being, totally, totally influences how many years that it could be paid back. We certainly can't. I mean, right now we're looking at you know, 130 ish. We certainly couldn't swallow that in one year. Um, right. We, may have, we may have an extended deficit for FY22 if the federal government doesn't come back. We may very well, maybe even beyond that. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, let me see if there's other questions. So, so the thing I'm struggling with, and I, I haven't, haven't quite got my thoughts in order yet, but um, the, and I believe it's true um, that there's no constitutional or um, there's no constitutional prohibition to carrying a deficit in the education fund. Uh, there is in a lot of states, but there's not in Vermont. Um, and so we don't need um, we don't need authority to carry a deficit. We do, um, you know, we do have a uh, sort of a 
quasi requirement in terms of the reserves. It's not entirely clear what it is, but it's there. So that needs to be, probably needs to be addressed. But the thought that I'm struggling with is that it seems to me that until we end fiscal 21, we're not in deficit. We're not in deficit in January if we project a gap um, that That's true. might be filled by an exploding yeah. economy all of a sudden. I realize it's probably not going to be, but let's, you know, we can yeah. we can fantasize that suddenly sales come back and we get tons of money. Um, and so there's no deficit until the end of 21. And so I guess I guess what I'm thinking. Um, I, 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 I like the idea of, of saying um, these are the property tax rates. Uh, we understand that we haven't solved everything. Um, and the way we plan to solve everything is using federal money, or if that fails, um, we will, you know, I, don't, I, I guess we'll uh, pay it back first with reversions and surplus. That, makes sense to me and it makes sense to me to say something about drawing the reserves down. Um, but the part that I keep having trouble with in here is the um, uh, section um, that talks about the deficit on or before July 1, 21, the deficit incurred under this section as though as though it's a given, um, and I think I think I'd feel better about this language if it said if a deficit is incurred, um, okay, then these these are the steps that we're going to follow um, to deal with it. Is, does that make sense to? I think it makes sense. I think it makes sense to make it a hypothetical instead of an absolute. Yeah, I think I think that's what I've been struggling yeah. with 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 yeah. this um, and. I, I um, you know, the other thing I was going to mention is, <clears throat> Mark, you sent me the uh, one more promising story about <laughs> that maybe having more flexibility. Do you want to share that with everybody? Um, yeah, if I can remember, and I, I sent you an article um, that <laughs> I think. Um, I can't, oh, no, I, Route 40, Route 50, Route 50. Is that what it's called? Secretary, Secretary Mnuchin um, suggested that. Um, rather than providing a COVID-4 and new money for state and local governments that they may be open to allowing more flexible use of the existing 1.25 billion that we have um, right now. Um, so um, that would be great if that happened. That would solve a lot, a lot of the issues yeah. we're dealing with right now. And then we wouldn't have to go through these contortions. Um, yeah. Again, that, that, may take, that may take some time. And so we're running into a time issue here about you know, waiting for that to happen. So leaving it, leaving it open and saying, if the money became available at some point, we would use it to solve the problem. I think allows you to go ahead with the bill if you want to, in terms of setting tax rates and that kind of thing. A, a lot of what I like about what Scott's put in front of us is it sets the tax rates. Is it says this is these are going to be the property tax rates for fiscal 21. Um, that discussion, we've we've decided that that this is where that discussion should end, um, and then clearly. The, the information that we're getting about the economy and about revenues and about the federal money and so on, just it's changing so quickly that, um, or sometimes recently it's been a little more slow, but, um, but it, it, it just isn't stable. And I, I don't feel that we can, we can resolve that maybe even until, certainly until late June, and it may even be July or August before we have enough information to do it. Uh, hopefully we would do it sooner, but um, and I, I, I'm not really sure. Uh, Peter and then Abby. I uh, thank you very much, Scott, and I, I agree that some certainty and commitment in the face of all the uh, uh, shifting sands is important, very important. I like the feature that <clears throat> we're promising to, albeit at a reduced level, uh, carry reserves into the future at some positive uh, greater than zero. I, I definitely agree that not having language in there assuming a deficit uh, is, is very useful. It adds a certain optimism and flexibility. Lastly, I've, uh, and this may be not appropriate for this particular proposal, but I continue to worry about the fact that uh, unless we've done something or should do something in the way of tapping the Ed Fund for school construction, that's one of those things that's sort of dangling out there that we began 
to talk about. And I, and I, I wish we had a way uh, to give schools some guidance whether those proposals would be uh, welcome or not welcome under the unusual circumstances of today. Yeah, and I, I don't know if we've talked about it in committee, but we do have the school construction bill in our committee that I think we should look at yeah. again. Um, it's, a, it's a hefty price tag, but it's also a much heftier problem um, that we, you know, we've moved to the poise to move something on that. So uh, somebody needs to remind me to put it on the agenda. Um, uh, Abby. I, um, in rereading subsection C in the main section two, um, I'm realizing that it seems to limit it to only those two sources of um, repayment. So I, if just for drafting to open it up a little bit, I would recommend adding a third saying and any other funds to leave some um, flexibility for the General Assembly to find other ways to pay back the deficit if there is a deficit. Yeah, I mean, what I envision sort of um, using Scott's draft as a jumping off point is we say, if there is a deficit, this is how we want to have it dealt with. And that would include any other source of revenue um, or, or um, uh, adjustments in spending um, that occur, you know, um, that, that would uh, deal with it so that we're not foreclosing anything. Um, George. I, I agree with that and I would, you know, so, you know, a line in there about any other, any other available funds for, or reductions in spending, but in line, on line eight of that same section, section C, page two, yep. um, I'm a little uncomfortable about setting a, diff, a um, percentage for the reserves for you know, um, perpetuity for any time that there's a any kind of deficit. You know, I definitely I understand. You know, lowering that that number for this year, but I'm a little uncomfortable about that being in there long term. I don't know how anybody else feels about it, but you know, I mean, doesn't that essentially change our our law about um, about our reserves? Well, it does. I mean, that's, um, you know, the law about reserves is changed in, in section B, subsection B just above George. When we were allowing the reserve that it may be drawn down to 2%. So we are, we are allowing for that at least temporarily. Um, yeah, I understand temp we're doing it yeah. temporarily, but I'm worried that in section C line eight makes it permanent, not temporary. Maybe we should consider a, a sunset or or um, define the deficit on a calendar. I don't know. Thoughts? Um, oh. I mean, that, the only question I've been having is uh, why why do we maintain a reserve if we're in deficit? Isn't the purpose of a reserve to pay down a deficit? Well, maybe. <laughs> There's another train of thought that um, that the first thing you should do is deficit spend and borrow if you can do that within your own mm -hmm. funds. If Because if you can't, if you ever can't, and you go out to the market, um, they're going to want to know what your reserves are. So there mm -hmm. are some that advocate hanging on to your reserves yeah. as collateral against borrowing instead of using your reserves first. But that's that's uh, finance philosophy, I guess. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I you know, um, I think this committee has been, um, in spite of all the uncertainties, has been really focused on coming up with a plan for fiscal twenty one that ends not in a deficit. So um, I, I don't want to assume that we're going to be unsuccessful doing that. Um, I'm, right. I'm, I see this as a contingency plan, but I would rather end 21 with zero in reserves and no deficit if I had to make a choice about it. Um, I'm not yep. 
state treasurer. I'm not a financial right. person, but that just makes more sense to me. Um, so um, even though I, uh, legally we can have a deficit, you know, not something that's particularly desirable um, yeah. or something I want to do. And a lot of that decision would, I would suspect at the treasurer's level would, yeah. you know, um, be dependent on what FY22 is looking like as well. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyone else want to weigh in on this? Mark, did you have any other comments um, that you wanted um, to offer? I just had some questions which, which I shared with um, Representative Beck this morning. And I, I think okay. most of them have been addressed, but yeah. um, I wanted to point out that, um, and this, these are contingencies that may not even come up, but um, although there's no prohibition against running a deficit, in the fund, I agree going forward with that. There is probably a practical um, limitation because um, you still have to have the cash flow necessary to fund education spending. So um, that, that may be a question for the treasurer, but um, given your take, which is that the, the goal is to have no deficit at the end of the year, that may not be a problem, but carrying forward, a, you know, if, if we were, for example, to carry forward a $150 million deficit, whether or not all the education payments can be made is a, is a question. Um, I, um, I also question whether or not rating agencies would care whether or not the, you, how you, you divide this problem up between the reserve and the deficit. In other words, I don't, I'm not sure that a, somebody coming to, the, to this, looking at it as, a, as right. a rating person would say that you're really in any different position, whether you have some in the reserve plus a deficit, or if you just empty the reserve and reduce the size of your deficit. To me, it doesn't really, from a, from a ratings agency perspective, I don't think it would make any difference, but I could be wrong again on that. That's a question maybe for the treasurer. Um, third point was the length of time. If there is a um, significant deficit, um, as long as the ones we're talking about, if you're only putting in you know, money, uh, any surplus that we have or any reversion, it would take a long, long time to pay off any deficit that, that we would have and then the last point was, um, is it realistic to think about starting to reducing to reducing the deficit apart from the federal money by FY22? In other words, are we, you know, FY22 is not looking great right now. We got a little look at the, at the estimates next, you know, for next year, and we're starting to come back up, especially in the education fund. I think we're in a position of first down and probably first back up because the problem is caused by consumption taxes, which fall first and rebound first. So it may not be a problem, but um, th those are questions I have. They're so a little bit out of my area. There are more questions for I think for the treasurer. But um, if that that was all. Otherwise, I think it I think it works fine. Yeah, I, I guess um, just listening to all this discussion, um, it, and I'll ask Scott this, but um, my sense is that it would be really useful to have the treasurer look at this. And yeah, um, um, if you want to do that on your own, and then we could have her in the committee when she's had a chance to review it. Um, I'd like to see a redraft that it is along the lines of, if there's a deficit, these are the things we're going to look at. Okay that kind of thing would, yeah. would help me. And I think it would help sort of explain what we're trying to do here. Um, mm -hmm. That, that we're, we're saying, uh, we, we recognize, um, well, I, I guess we recognize the possibility of a deficit and the, yeah. these are the plans for it. Um, I hope when we're reporting this, we're saying it's our intention to come up with a proposal um, using as much federal money as we can that will avoid a deficit. Um, not, not our plan to go into deficit, um, but but if, if it happens, this is yeah. what we want to do. Yeah, I'd be more than happy to work with Abby on getting those points put in there, and then okay. um, have you know share it with Beth and have a conversation with her. That'd be great. Um, other and and then we'll have her in front of the committee, but we should sure. prepare her a bit, I think. Um, are there other um, other thoughts that people have? I see that Kate Webb is with us. Um, I, I don't know if there's anything that she wants to weigh in on. Um, not at this time. I really uh, appreciate the, the questions and, and the deliberation you're doing. Um, I think the points you're raising are interesting. And we will. Uh, I also really appreciate that you are starting to look at uh, bringing, um, bringing the yield forward. Just move, moving that and getting that off the table. I think that would be really beneficial. Um, for for everyone in the system, so yeah. Great. Thank you. Yes, the clerks are the clerks are calling. 
town clerks are calling. Oh, <laughs> they're not, no, that's, I don't know. They're not calling me. <laughs> uh, Sam. Did you call on me? I did. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I was wondering if we could potentially hear from somebody either like from our federal delegation, I mean, somebody in one of the federal offices, or maybe like the NC NCSL must be looking at this issue. I mean, I, I, in terms of the, you know, the, the feds allowing us to replace lost revenue. I mean, yeah. every state has got to be dealing with this and it's a much bigger problem in every state. And I just wonder like what the status of the discussions in Washington are. And I wondered if we could like get a brief update from somebody on that. Let's see what I can do. I, every state is struggling with it and they tend to, everyone sort of does what, what I do is I see the story that says that Mnuchin is open to it. I think, hey, you know, this sounds promising and so far it hasn't amounted to anything, but um, I'll see what, what we can, what we can find out. An idea. I, there's a lot on the NCSL site about it um, because they're very, they're very worried. All states are worried. Right. Yeah. Peter. Uh, I, if I were in Washington playing a game of chicken with the Senate majority, I would be loath to expose my strategy. And if the D's are hoping for COVID four, and Mnuchin wants to trade loosening up uh, CARES three for CARES four, I'd be a little afraid of uh, <laughs> saying yes. Uh, anyone else? So are people sort of agreed that uh, as, as a way to proceed, I guess we need to, aren't we on the floor like soon here? 11. Oh, not till 11. I thought the floor was at 11. It is at 11. Yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was at 10.30. I was rushing through here. Um, huh, I would have asked for 7.16 back, but I guess you wouldn't have to do that. Um, uh, other issues um, on on this. Okay. So we have a plan, and I thought we were supposed to be done by ten fifteen. So we are. <laughs> <laughs> um, let me just double check um, my list of things. So I guess I guess um, what we'll do is we'll have a it'll be a brief meeting tomorrow, but we will get through as much as we can. And I think I'm going to um, uh, put this issue back on the table for next Tuesday to give uh, Scott some time to work with Bill Pierce and uh, Abby some time to redraft along the lines of what we're talking about. But it would be great if we were able to actually move this next week and. Uh, get this piece of the puzzle off the table. Um, I think that's really where we need to be. Um, and um, I will double check about school construction. I think I might bring that up in the committee again, just to remind us what we had, the work we had done. Um, and the other two bills are the two uh, local, I think it was two local option bills that are coming in and 716. So that'll be our work um, both tomorrow and next week. Yeah. Anything else anyone has? Great. Uh, so Sam, you're all set on miscellaneous tax. I'm sure he is. Let's put his picture up there. Okay. We'll see everybody on the. Floor. I'm all set. I'm all set. Excellent. Okay. Appreciate appreciate your backup when I, when jumping in. The, the the speaker knows the call on you when you raise your hand and and uh. The only time I've ever raised it on the on the full floor, but I was so excited that tax was supportive. <laughs> so, uh, okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the live stream now. Okay. okay.